Hi, this is Andrew with Eskimo TV, and I'd like to welcome Donna Seil. She's a lawyer, writer, and founder of Law Practice Strategy, a service center addressing the future of law practice and legal technology. Donna, I want to welcome you to Eskimo. Thanks for interviewing with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The topic we're going to talk about is law and cloud technology. In what ways are data portability a key concern of companies considering a cloud move? Uh, data port uh, portability is extremely uh, important to lawyers because the data that they are putting in the cloud is uh, actually, it, it's a question of ownership. Um, and the lawyer needs to retain ownership of that data, um, not only for him or herself, but also for her client, his or her client. And so that needs to be clarified in the, just from the outset when you are researching vendors and, um, trying to make a decision about what cloud platform you would like to, um, you know, use in your practice. Uh, one of the key terms that you uh, should try to find either in the uh, service level agreement or which, or the terms of service. Um, frequently, these terms are in, are included in the click wrap agreement that uh, all sites have, and you need to read. Lawyers need to read those very carefully because if it doesn't have any. Uh, uh, information in the terms of service and what the cloud provider's position is on that, uh, on data portability, then you need to have a conversation with the vendor about what happens when um, they want to take their data and go somewhere else. Uh, it needs to be not just made portable from a functional standpoint, but also uh, he needs to be sure, the lawyer needs to be sure that the vendor does not claim ownership of content. Uh, and so it, it, it's actually an extremely important point um, that needs to be clarified at the outset and, um, and uh, so that you know that if you want to go somewhere else, you can take all of your content and data with you. How can a customer retrieve their data if they decide to go somewhere else? Uh, do all cloud companies have this functionality? Well, there, there's certainly no reason why a cloud company uh, uh, wouldn't be able to uh, create a function that enables this. Um, and so the question is not so much can you do it? The question is, will the vendor uh, agree to have that happen? Uh, uh, and so the vendor really, while you're having a conversation about what their policies are on retaining content, you should also have the, uh, the conversation about what, um, how that process is going to happen. What are the steps the vendor is going to take? in order to make it accessible, are they going to download it into, you know, spreadsheets or, or whatever? How, what format are you going to get content back in and make sure that it is then uploadable to whatever vendor, whatever other vendor you go to, or uh, even if you decide to get out of the cloud altogether, um, it has to remain, you know, in some format that is intelligible. So, again, um, part of the conversation that you have with the vendor about how this is going to happen, because it's really up to them. And do all vendors have it? Uh, again, they can have it. They can create it, even if they haven't. And if they don't, then – if they won't, then lawyers should not um, create a relationship with them. Why haven't attempts to build standards to neutralize cloud lock-in been successful at this point? Well, like a lot of things related to cloud technology, there's a number of issues 
that are coming up as we kind of, you know, go along on, on to take this walk, take this journey um, into the cloud. And, uh, and, you know, really in terms of time, um, the push into the cloud is only a few years old. And, um, and so as, as issues like this come up, they are dealt with. Um, but not always as they definitely are not dealt with <laughs> quickly enough for, uh, for when they arise to address the issue. Uh, but as time goes along and people see, oh, this is something that really needs to be addressed, uh, it, it will eventually get there. It's just that it really hasn't been that long of a period of time in which uh, you know, the, these things um, are, are, have, are used, are, in which lawyers are pushed to use, not pushed, I don't want to use that term, but, um, but, but in which it's really important for lawyers to be able to use, uh, you know, how the regulation of how it's used um, and all of these issues, you know, are, are, are coming, are following the parade. And it's because it's accelerated so enormously in the past few years um, it just hasn't gotten there yet but it will can you tell me a little bit what are, about what are cloud ethics cloud ethics okay um, the ABA actually created um, a commission called Ethic, uh, ethics 2020 which is really um, the mission of that commission was to study the model rules in light of uh, lawyers using all of this new technology and determining whether or not the use of the technology and, um, well, in determining whether or not the use of the technology violates uh, professional rules of conduct in any way and and whether or not we need to create more rules whether or not we need to change the existing rules etc cetera, etc cetera. now the problem with regulation is that it, the more regulation that you have uh, the more of it, it, it has a chilling effect on innovation and uh, at we don't need that in the legal profession. If anything, we need uh, support so that we can move forward in uh, integrating this into the profession as a whole. Um, so what the ABA has done is, is and, and many, by, and it's not just the ABA, also many states have, have addressed these issues as well. But what they've done is they've looked at existing uh, ethical obligations such as um, uh, the duty of confidentiality, for instance. Now, that is a basic uh, ethical obligation that the lawyer has to, and, to, and to safeguard the, uh, the data and the content uh, of, of the client. And uh, so they look at the rules and say, well, um, does the fact that the lawyer is using cloud technology um, require more restrictive um, behavior does it require do we need to write more into this rule and and so I, it wasn't exact I don't know if it was the rule of confidentiality I think it was the uh, the competence um, the model rule of competence where they did in fact um, add the obligation of the lawyer to stay apprised of the technology that they are using uh, in addition to the other thing uh, things that they need to stay apprised of to be competent lawyers. Um, and that and the standard is because it because it technology changes so much, they haven't really um, enumerated the steps that a lawyer should take because they're different in, in each instance. And so they have adopted uh, a standard of reasonableness in terms of looking at, you know, did the lawyer do 
his or her due diligence in uh, vetting the vendor that they are now, um, you know, uh, housing their content, uh, who has the servers where their content is. And so, so there's kind of that additional, that additional um, requirement um, to make sure that you're staying apprised of the technology that, that you're using. Um, and it comes up, and then there's also another issue about uh, unauthorized practice of law that comes up because lawyers are only licensed in certain jurisdictions. And, um, and then the other part of it is that um, they can have a virtual practice. Say they're a Maryland lawyer, and uh, they have a virtual practice, and they live in Florida. How, you know, how does that work in terms of who can they represent? Well, you really still can only represent the people in the jurisdiction where you're licensed. And so you've got to be really careful when people are contacting you via the Internet to uh, be sure that that's where these people reside. Uh, the, the, the second part of it is you have to look at the state rules and determine uh, if there are any restrictions for you to practice um, uh, representing people, representing clients in other jurisdictions, even though you're living somewhere else. For instance, uh, New Jersey used to have um, a, a bona fide office rule, which meant that you had to have, you had to be physically present in the state and had to have a business address in the state to practice law, you know, as a licensed New Jersey lawyer. And that was a real problem for lawyers who were licensed in New Jersey but decided to move to New York because then they couldn't practice online. Um, fortunately, that has since changed and New Jersey has changed their law. But you need to check with, the, with your state's uh, regulations and, um, and and make sure that you're staying within existing extra guidelines. Great, Donna. Thank you for answering these questions on law and cloud technology and giving your time and expertise to Eskimo TV. Thank you very much. Okay, you're welcome.